Good morning. Welcome to worship on this lovely seventh day of July, and we're in the heart of summer now, and the heat's picking up, but it's lovely to have some rain, although right now it's just fog, but I'm sure it's doing something, well, good, for the nourishing of the ground. Now, since last we met, and some of us weren't here, but since last we met, which wasn't very long ago, it was only last week, <laughs> It occurred to me that I might be running out of pithy things to share with you each Sunday about my life in between our gatherings together. Last week, I had to resort to my haircut. That's getting down there, folks. So this past Tuesday, I met someone in the grocery store. She recognized me, and I fortunately recognized her. And since she was polite enough to introduce herself, give me her name, without my prompting, I knew from whence we had previously met. Conversation happened. The upshot shot of this or very ordinary day's event is that I am now getting a dog. <laughs> now, now, for those who haven't been here, there's, I did have a cat for a short time, a few months, and, and they heard an entirely too much about that cat. Cat's name was Molson. The dog's name will not be Molson. Dog's name is Lily. And I have hoop, hoops to go through yet, but as she is an elder dog and the elder dog organization needs to know, Lily will be well treated in her new home. There will be no cats, so she will be. But I am pretty sure we are a match, and she's a beagle. And she's an older beagle, fortunately. <laughs> How many of you have had beagles? <laughs> beagles are lovely. My neighbors, had a, my neighbors nearest me had, had a dog that barked a lot, so I'm, I'm, and he's not there anymore, the dog, but the neighbors are, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> anyway, uh, soon, though not for a couple of wait, weeks, but soon, I will have a new batch of fun-filled experiences to share with you all. Announcements. We are pleased this morning to have a memorial dedication uh, later in the service in memory of Eleanor and Clarence Ross. And this morning's bulletins are given in loving memory of Emma Summers by Jack and Arlene Sorensen and family, and in loving memory of Mildred Smith by Barb Elaine and families. Reverend Karen is still on vacation, and I will be covering for her again next Sunday, as well as I'll be on call for emergency, should we have any, until she returns. On July 21st, there will be an outdoor service at the Argyle Shore Provincial Park at 10.30 a.m. Reverend Karen will be back for that service. She will be back for that service, or you won't be having it. <laughs> at the Provincial Park, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> you've had these services at the, at the park before, so I assume you know what to bring, like chairs, perhaps, bugs, bug spray, that, that sort of thing. Items collected in the donations box will go to the South Shore Food Share for the month of July, and Camp Abbey continues to need supplies and staffing. And there are a number of bullet announcements that have been um, in your bulletins for a few weeks. The wonders and responsibilities of summer are upon us, and we continue to answer a call guided by Creator and Spirit God to acknowledge regularly that we live and worship on the unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq and other indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this island for thousands of years. And please join with me in our call to worship, our responsive call to worship. Why do we come to this place each week? This is our family. But community gathers everywhere. Family is home and abroad. Why here? Why now? We come because we always have, and because throughout all time and space, God calls to us. Perhaps it's because this place shapes our week, this community of faith. Perhaps things seem different, clearer, when we settle together in the presence and awareness of our God. Here we find calm. Here we find purpose. The sense of home and community is strong. We listen to each other's experiences of life and of God. God's spirit is strong here. Together we are stronger. Together we are God's people, doing our best to hear the spirit and follow where God leads. 
on, into the world. And so we come to worship together. And our hymn is number 205 in Voices United, like the murmur of a dove's song. Let us join together in our opening prayer, our unison opening prayer. Let us pray. What is your favorite song, O oh God? The one you hum along the immensity of the universe. The one you whistle while creating new things. Have we heard it? Is it in your repertoire? Is it even in the treasuries of all great religions? Is it the lament whispered by a mother to her dying child, or the delightful cooing of first love? Give us one note of it to savor and ponder, to begin to make chords and tunes and harmonies. Rattle it around in our heads, send it surging through our fingertips. Give us a hint of your song, as we pray together familiar words taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to read a passage from Ralph Milton's Lectionary Story Bible. And um, just for those who are younger here today, there are, uh, there are a couple of people. I mean, they're not people. No, they're not people. Um, Pooh and Tigger are back there in the tab at the table in the back in case anybody wants to join them at any time during the service. That's, that's fair game because they like company. May the Holy Spirit guide our readings, our listening, and our understandings this morning. Amen. And this story is called David Becomes King. Jonathan and his father were dead. David felt sad about that for a long time. The people of Israel were sad, too. Yes, but we need a king to be our leader. Let's go and talk to David. David, they said, you are one of us. We are all relatives. You come from Bethlehem, and we know your family. David nodded. That was true. When King Saul was our leader, you were often the one who led the soldiers out to the wars, and you led them back again. Now David was smiling. He remembered the happy times before King Saul got sick, the times when he and his friend Jonathan did fun things together. We think God wants you to be like a shepherd for the people of Israel. God wants you to help us the way a shepherd looks after sheep. We want you to be our king. David knew that God wanted him to be the king of Israel, but he was afraid too. I wonder if I can be a good king, he thought. I'm only 30 years old. I think I'm going to need some help. 
Not long after that, people from all over Israel came to meet with David at a place called Hebron. We will help you, they said. We will help you be a good king. And so they made a covenant. A covenant is a promise people make to each other when they get married or when other important things happen. We will do our best to help you be a good king, said the people. God help us. I will, be, I will do my best to help you be good people, said David. God help me. And so it was that David became the king of Israel. He was king for 40 years, a very long time. And our hymn is number 126 in more voices. I don't know if people have them there, but this green will be show the words. Are you a shepherd? Good morning. Today's reading is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown, followed by his disciples. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many people were there, and when they heard him, they were all amazed. Where did he get all this, they asked. What wisdom is this that has been given to him? And how does he perform miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, that son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters living here? And so they rejected him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is respected everywhere except in his own hometown and by his relatives and his family. He was not able to perform any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was greatly surprised because the people did not have faith. So then Jesus went to the villages around there teaching the people. He called the 12 disciples together and he sent them out two by two. He gave them authority over the evil spirits and he ordered them, don't take anything with you on your journey except a stick. No bread, no beggar's bag, no money in your pockets. Make sure you wear sandals, but don't carry an extra shirt. He also said, wherever you are welcomed, stay in that same house until you leave that place. If you come to a town where people do not welcome you and will not listen to you, leave it and shake the dust off your feet. That will be a warning to them. 
And so they went out and preached that people should turn away from their sins. They drove out many demons and rubbed olive oil on many sick people and healed them. The issue that seems to be crying out to us from the scriptures this morning is authority. By what authority does David become king? By what authority can Jesus teach and heal and offer a way of life as our creator God intends? By what authority do we imagine or know the way of life our creator God intends? Then, of course, there is the question of by what authority our political leaders guide our provinces and countries, our teachers teach our children and adults as well, our health care staff make decisions each day. By what authority do police officers stop us on the road as we go about our business? And more, by what authority are rent and mortgages and property taxes levied? It seems that just about every decision we make and how we live our lives, whether it be here on PEI, anywhere in Canada, or in every country or area of this world, has some question of authority behind it. Not much wonder children, trying to make sense of their young lives, discover the word why so young and threaten to drive us all crazy, asking it over and over again. I'm sure some people don't, some children never say that. No. But but we want questions. Why is what we always ask. And not much wonder we sometimes don't have answers to the question why if we haven't thought about the why of it ourselves. And we don't or can't take the time to ponder each question as it comes up. If we could only take that time, we might be able to learn and grow right alongside our children, whether indeed they are actually ours or those in which we come in contact during our lives. In this way, we would be constantly clarifying what matters, how we make decisions, and what kind of people we are or want to be. I guess the question, the issue really is, by what authority do we live our lives in the way we do? It has to be very frustrating at any age if the answer is, we just do. But what parent hasn't finally, no matter how desperately they do not want to, succumb to answering just because? In our Hebrew scripture reading from 2 Samuel, David has just been crowned king over all of Israel. By what authority did he become king? Our children's version of today's passage gives us some answers. David, you are one of us. We are all relatives. You come from Bethlehem and we know your family. Then looking back, the people of Israel realized that David was often the one who led the soldiers out to the wars when Saul was king. And they led them back again, and he led them back again. So he was successful in protecting the people of Israel. The people knew David had been a shepherd and they thought God wanted him to be like a shepherd for the people of Israel. And an important factor was that David also knew that God wanted him to be king, but David did not think he could do it alone. So the people of Israel promised to help David be a good king, and David promised to do his best to help them be good people. He asked God to help him. That would be God calling, by the way. (laughs) They all made a covenant, they all made a covenant together. And David reigned for 40 years, and it has long been considered a time of peace for the people of Israel. David's authority then came from the people of Israel and from God. And it keeps, it, 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 I haven't got this written down, but it reminds me of a covenant with a minister. You know, a minister is, if, if, if he or she is wise, he, she, or they is wise, would be scared to get up here. You'd you really should be scared to get up here and open your mouth at all. But we are in covenant with the congregation and we're in covenant with the wider church and we are certainly in covenant with God and all of those help us get up here and speak. So thank you for that. David's authority then came from the people of Israel and from God. I suspect that without the guidance and encouragement from God and the affirmation and help of the people of Israel, David would never have been such a successful king. His success was certainly not because he was a good person all the time. He let power and his place of privilege corrupt corrupt him over and over again. 
But over and over again, he came to his God contritely and tried to change his ways. And God and the people of Israel stuck with him. Many years later, another born in Bethlehem arrives on the scene, or so our holy story goes. Some, if not most, of the people of Israel are desperate for the biblical anointed God, one of God, the Messiah, to come and rescue them from the Roman oppression under which they now lived. Mark, our gospel writer for today, does not bother with a birth story of Jesus. He jumps right into the adult life, Jesus' life with his baptism by John and God's voice from heaven saying to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Mark's gospel has only two verses describing Jesus' experience in the wilderness. Other gospels have a long passages. He dispenses with John the Baptist in five words. After that, Jesus chooses his disciples and he is off to live out his ministry of dispensing with demons, healing the sick and teaching as any good rabbi would. He speaks in parables. He has control over the elements, calming the seas. He restores a young girl from death and his healing energy and a woman's faith and courage heal her of her misery. Where does his authority rest? Perhaps he finds it in the desperation and belief of some of God's people. Certainly, he finds it from his Abba, his Father God. And his authority comes from the acts of saving grace he offers to those in need coming to him for help. His reputation goes before him. And then Jesus comes home. Where did this man get all this, they said, when he was teaching in the synagogue? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the son of the carpenter and of Mary and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? Have you ever had a similar experience of going home to discover you are just the same as when you left to those at home? with not much authority at all? Youth going to college or university for years sometimes have that feeling of being a child all over again when they come home. You or me as an adult return home or retire after many years of life-changing experiences and gaining new skills, only to struggle with feeling as if you haven't changed at all in the eyes of those who didn't share that part of your life journey. Or someone comes home to visit after many years only to see you as they expect to see you. Your experiences, your accomplishments, your growth are not recognized for what you, they are, you. The you that by the grace of God and life has changed. So I wonder, did Jesus feel unable to be his full self in the midst of those who saw him as he was before he left home? Perhaps he wasn't able to recognize or acknowledge the authority granted to him by God and others in the midst of the offense taken by those others at his presence. In his, at his presence. I wonder, though, why this passage is in Mark's gospel, his efforts to lift up Messiah as, uh, Jesus as the Messiah is strong throughout God, Mark's gospel. I don't know how this helps it seems, though, that even in Mark's time, admittedly not so long after Jesus' death and resurrection, some people were not granting Jesus, and perhaps even Mark, the authority many others were granting. There was a lot going on in Jesus' time and in Mark's time. There's a lot going on in our time that makes it hard for everyone to grant the same kinds of authority that would make this world a better place, hopefully, for all. Jesus couldn't do much about it. He spoke his words. Prophets are not without honor, except, and he goes on, acknowledging himself as a prophet and probably saying in his own way that he has honor in other places, but here in his hometown, among his family and his own home, there is no honor for him. Still, he did manage to lay his hands on a few sick people and cure him. And I think perhaps that's Mark's drawing Back, Jesus back into who Jesus is. It seems to have come as a shock to Jesus, however, 
how he was received. He was amazed at their unbelief. And the other half of the gospel reading is helping his followers recognize that sometimes there will be people who do not recognize their authority to teach and heal and have authority over the unclean spirits. Just take it in stride and move, move on. Shake off the dust that is on your feet as you leave, he says. By what authority then do we live our lives in the way we do? Do we check with God regularly to see if we are on the right track? Or when we desperately need guidance or have a decision to make? Are we willing to recognize that some might not accept the authority we believe guides our decisions? Do we seek the help of those who might also help us make our decisions? Are we in covenant with each other as King David was with his people and his God? Is this why our United Church works through the committee and meeting process? It allows many to have a say before a decision is made. It allows the spirit to speak through many life experiences, expertise, hopes, and dreams. Two short stories to highlight the way people can choose to walk through life with authority, whether others want to follow that way or not. My son's basketball team was the University of North Carolina, and so now you know what that's doing up there. He was a wonderful basketball player in high school, and I love basketball and have played it all when I was in high school and university. And so I adopted the UNC as my team so I could take part not knowledgeably when we talked about his team. I looked up the word Tar Heels, what it meant, as they are the North Carolina Tar Heels. This is what I discovered, and I quote, to call someone a Tar Heel was to imply that they worked in a lowly trade. During the Civil War, North Carolina soldiers flipped the meaning of the term and turned an epithet which is a term of verbal abuse, into an accolade, which is a privilege or honor. They called themselves Tar Heels as an expression of state pride. And now thousands of ball caps and jerseys, and I'm sure other sports as well as basketball, have the Tar Heel symbol worn proudly. By what authority did those North Carolina soldiers live their lives, I wonder? Whatever it was, and I suspect we know, it spread throughout North Carolina and further afield. Perhaps it was their way of just shaking off the dust that was on their feet as a testimony against those who did not welcome them. One other, and I don't remember much of the details of this, but while serving a pastoral charge here on the island, I wrote, I wrote a letter to the editor of The Guardian. I did that occasionally, but, but really very rarely. The subject had something to do with responding to another letter or a news article about some unjust practice perpetrated on a couple of our 2S LGBTQIA plus brothers and sisters here on the island years ago. I got a phone call in my office about that letter. It is a small island, so I wasn't really surprised, but I was surprised at this woman's views and her reasonable tone while speaking utter nonsense to my mind. She called my church office, so she must have known I was a minister. However the conversation went, I must at some point have said something about Jesus. I imagine it was in response to having a Bible verse or two thrown into the conversation to give authority to her arguments. I probably quoted or lifted up Jesus and his focus on love of all people as my authority. Her response, which I will never forget, was simple. Jesus is a sissy. And from the bottom of my heart and soul, I just laughed out loud because I just couldn't stop myself. I've never heard of anything so ludicrous in my life. And clearly, the woman did not know Jesus. After my response, the congregation trailed off and finally ended. I wonder, did she expect me to be angry? No, I think laughter was the best way to shake off the dust that was on my feet, metaphorically speaking, of course. I will give us this, we were both very polite up to that moment, so I don't think my laughter was an inappropriate response to her calling Jesus a sissy. One reason we come to church is to hopefully find answers in our hearts to our questions about things we consider to be very important, like life and death and life beyond death and all the day-to-day -day quandaries as well. 
In this way, coming to church, taking part in the decision-making, listening to others and sharing our views, sharing our talents and other resources, praying to God together, we can be regularly clarifying what matters, how we make decisions, and what kind of people we are or want to be. Together with God's guiding spirit and Jesus the sissy showing us the way, we discover from whence our own authority comes. God being our helper, may it always be so. ask now for Carolyn and Sheila and Charlene to come forward for the dedication. So we'll have a little prayer. Giver of all gifts, it is by your power that all things are made holy. We give you thanks for your marvelous wonders and for the work of human hands. Be with us now as we receive this memorial gift today. We ask for your blessing and offer this gift to your service. May your light shine upon what we do here this day. Amen. In loving memory of Clarence and Eleanor Ross, we present the choir microphones that Jack and John have installed to be dedicated to the glory and praise of God. With gratitude, we accept this memorial gift of choir microphones. We will care for them and use them reverently. Let us pray again. Creator God, source of all inspiration and beauty, we thank you for the gift of these choir microphones now dedicated to the glory of your name. We thank you for the many years that Eleanor played the organ and directed the choir, which included Clarence and the girls, for all that was beautiful and good in their lives and the way they lived their faith and hope. We express our gratitude, for through these gifts, their witness lives on. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, today's mission and service minute is Northern United Church ministers are facing a crisis. The number of deaths in Northern communities has been immense, and the grief of burying community members, especially young people, has been overwhelming. The emotional toll of ministering to a grieving community is enormous, and ministers are in dire need of rest and renewal. A minister's retreat is being planned for October 2024. The retreat will provide rest, training in crisis management, and spiritual renewal, and will allow leaders to return with renewed strength to help those in need. Ministers will participate in a blend of training and respite opportunities, including learning about vicarious trauma and administering naloxone 
and relaxation opportunities through art therapy, beading workshops, and sharing circles. Through your generous support of mission and service, this retreat is on its way to being a reality. If you would like to support the retreat, please give. Every dollar donated will be matched by a contribution from the Healing Fund. Thank you. When we give of ourselves, when we offer, out, when we offer, our, when we offer out of thanks and blessings received, when we care about others nearby and far away, when we remember those gone before us, when we remember you, O oh God, are the source of all goodness and love, then we seek opportunities. We seek opportunities to share our gifts, our talents, and other resources so that your light might shine and your song might be heard ringing true in our hearts, in our churches, and in the world. Thank you, Creator God, for all that we offer today and throughout the week. Guide us in what we do and help us follow where you lead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And our offertory hymn is number 3537. Three, Your work, O God, needs many hands. Let's gather our hearts in prayer. Loving Creator God, we look to you with wonder and thanks at the summer beauty all around. We see the cycles of life playing out over and over again. Tiny birds take flight for the first time as courage and instinct guide their way. Many protesting young adults pack up their bags as school ends. Home, jobs, inter internships, and other responsibilities take center stage for now. Ball fields and beaches begin to take on new life, and the smell of barbecues and campfires fill the air. Families travel, others welcome them home. New jobs begin, others ease up for a time, still others come to an end. For some, these are only dreams or memories. For others, they fill our days. Be with us all, we pray, and help us care for each other as if each one of us and each person we meet is the precious child you call us and try to show us we are. With all that summer brings that is beautiful and fun, you know that in the lives of many, struggles exist. Health is fragile, finances can be intimidating, loved ones challenging, decisions overwhelming, change confusing, and even sadly, violence threatening. Help us take time to quiet our minds and seek your loving and ever-present guidance, no matter our circumstances. Guide us to breathe in deeply, pause, and know you are with us and with our loved ones too, here and throughout this magnificent and troubled world and beyond. Show us ways to look to you and follow where you guide more and more often. Now as we gather together in your presence, we take a moment in silent prayer to take that conscious breath and feel your love surround us and all those on our minds today. With the authority of your loving presence and guiding spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. For the fruit of all creation.
And now may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.